friends, tonight I would like to begin my remarks with an impression. A literal impression. <laughs> Do you remember Jules Winfield in Pulp Fiction in 1994, that Samuel Jackson's character? The path of the righteous man is beset on all sides by the iniquities of the selfish and the tyranny of evil men. Blessed is he who in the name of charity and goodwill shepherds the weak through the valley of darkness, for he is truly his brother's keeper and the finder of lost children. And I will strike down upon thee with great vengeance and furious anger those who attempt to poison and destroy my brothers. And you will know my name is the Lord when I lay my vengeance upon thee. Do you remember that scene? Because if not, this is a very strange thing happening. <laughs> So, in the movie, Samuel Jackson's character says that that's a quote from Ezekiel 25, 17. And the truth is, it's only the very, very last part. You know, and you will know that my name is the Lord when I lay my vengeance upon you. Every year, during this Torah portion, I think of that scene. <laughs> Kitavo, this week's portion, is best known for its portrayal of a vengeful God. And within it, we find this vengeful God offering a massive list of curses known as the Tochacha. Let me set the scene. Deuteronomy chapter 27, Moses is describing an elaborate ceremony that is to be performed after crossing the Jordan River as the Israelites enter into the Promised Land. Moses tells the people that they are to divide their leaders of their tribes into two groups, to have one stand on one mountain over here and another across the valley on a mountain over there. Those on the mountain are to pronounce a list of blessings on this mountain, and on this mountain, a list of conditional curses. Blessings are to be proclaimed, curses are to be proclaimed, and after each one, the people are to reply, Amen. For those of you that were here two weeks ago, think about that. What does it mean to say amen when someone says, you will be cursed? If the people follow the rules, these are some of the blessings. Adonai will give you abounding prosperity for you and your children, for your cattle and the produce of your soil in the land that God swore to your ancestors. Adonai will open the heavens and provide rain for your land and will bless all your undertakings. You will be a creditor to many, a debtor to none. But those that don't follow the rules. Cursed be the person who makes an idol and sets it up in secret. Cursed is the person who dishonors their parents, the one who harms the blind, the one who harms the stranger, the orphan, the widow, the one who engages in sexual deviancy, the one who takes a bribe to kill. Cursed are those who do not, not maintain all the words of this Torah and do them. People that don't follow the law. The Torah tells us that those who act in a way that's worthy of those curses, Adonai will let loose calamity and panic and frustration in all that you undertake so that you will be utterly wiped out. Your carcasses shall become food for the birds of the sky and beasts of the earth. You shall be helpless. Life will be precarious. You will live in terror with no assurance of survival. And perhaps the most terrifying, God will send you back to Egypt. I read this and all of a sudden threatening to take away TV from my kids for not behaving is like, teen. <laughs> this section of our Torah is really uncomfortable. In fact, it's so uncomfortable that there's customs to read most of it very quickly and quietly and with no breaks, sort of just to get it over with as fast as possible. It's a particular reading that we don't offer the honor of an aliyah to. Just the person that's reading says the blessings. We don't give it out to anybody. I mean, who would want that? Standing at the Torah and hearing that. So why do we read it year after year if it's so awful? And why do we even have this list? I want to offer a few thoughts that I think are relevant for this moment in our lives and in the Jewish calendar. To begin, a thousand years ago, approximately, the Rashbam, the grandson of Rashi, our most famous commentator, 
famously wrote that the common denominator between those curses, the things that people do that could be harmful, they are all things that might be performed by seter, in private, in secret, things that might not get discovered. This threat of curse and punishment is meant to help prevent wrong actions that might happen away from someone else's eyes, with no one to witness, and out of the reach of society's system of justice. The curses aren't pointing to public wrongdoing. Public sins were dealt with by the court system, or at least we would hope. But we all know stories where someone did something in private and got away with it never made it to the courts. And we all know what happens when it becomes public. We don't have to look too far into our newspapers today to see what happens when the private is exposed. I believe that the Torah is here trying to raise our self-consciousness by calling out secret wrongdoings, making people consider themselves potentially cursed even if there are no witnesses. Moses is pleading with us to do right, even if no one is watching. <coughs> Let's consider for a moment. Which would you think more effective? Fear of punishment by the courts, or fear of punishment by God? Which would you fear more? Which do you think the ancient Israelites feel feared more? And perhaps that's the point, to make us consider this idea, to cause us to reflect on what we think and do in private and how we act and present in public. And which matters more, the public realm, the private realm? Do we allow ourselves to treat one another, one or the other, excuse me, as more important? Our Torah makes it clear that both matter. Perhaps that the private matters even more. There's a delicate interplay between our insides that are baseter, our secrets, and our outside, which are public. In the outside world, when others are watching, it should be easier to act rightly, right? Yet, the Torah is acknowledging we all have private, hidden moments in our life. Things that we do when no one else is with us. I want us to consider the power held in that, in those secret private things. They're intense and urgent. Let me show you what I mean. Do you have a secret about yourself that no one else knows? Do you know a secret that someone shared with you that you promised not to tell? What's it like holding that secret? Whether it's good or shameful, we know how potent powerful, just the knowledge of that is. Gosh, Rabbi, this sure is an uplifting sermon. <laughs> I, I wrote that. <laughs> I know. So I want to tell you a story from Jewish folklore, a famous story, that I think shows this power of what things can be and do and impact in private and in secret. One day, a shepherd boy was passing by a synagogue and heard people inside praying. He went inside to join them, but there was a problem. They were all praying from prayer books, and he didn't know how to read. He didn't know, he didn't know the prayers, but he did know the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. So not knowing what else to do, he, he snuck himself into the very back corner of the room, hid his face, and whispered quietly and secretly to himself, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, until he finished the entire Hebrew alphabet. And then into his heart he said, God, this is all I can do. You know how the prayers should be pronounced. Please take those letters and put them in the proper order. The rabbi noticed this boy hiding in the corner and went over him inquired what was going on. The boy didn't answer. He didn't say a thing. The rabbi sat with him for a few moments and said, you know, 
God responds to our heartfelt intentions. The boy smiled and ran back to his flock. The story says at the end that the boy's prayers went straight up to heaven. A secret, a whisper, just an olive. The story tells us it's more powerful than the prayers of the entire congregation chanting together. We are in the month of Elul, the month leading up to the high holidays of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And this portion sometimes comes during that month. And I learned from it that we should not be afraid of the curses, but that we should be inspired to focus on the private, on the basetir, the secret spaces in our own lives and hearts. In a, month, in a few weeks, we will confess our sins as a community. We will do so on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and that is public, and we should prepare to do so. But what about the private? In this month, we are instructed to do a cheshbon hanefesh, an accounting of our soul. And that also means our secrets and our private lives that no one else witnesses. Things that we can't truly show others. Things that we need to uncover that are hidden. This is the time of year for us to unearth and bear our souls. So why read these curses year after year and why now, before the holidays? I found an answer in the Talmud that I like. Rabbi Abaye suggests that we finish the Jewish year as we read these curses, to put them behind us. As if to say all of our troubles, those secrets, should be yesterday's news. Let us do the work to begin the new year with a clean slate. How deep will your search be your facet here, your private, your secret. What are you willing to tell yourself? What are you willing to tell God? What are you willing to tell Sam Jackson? <laughs> Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.